just want to, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, Austin Geisberg, this is Gregory Folk, Kristen Sanders, the artist. Um, we've both of them quite a while, but um, like I said, you know, I think uh, Gregory was originally the professor of Kristen in graduate school, and they kept up a wonderful relationship, and we're very excited that they're both in the city and available for this talk. So please get up for the talk. So we want to just start over here. Let's do it. I, so one of the it's true what I just said. I was a professor and an art writer, but I was a professor at Virginia Commonwealth University from 2004 to 2020 in both the painting department and the sculpture department. Not teaching art writing, but working intensely with artists, and one of the really fascinating things, I mean, it's so energizing, is like new artists would come in, you know, each year, and, and sometimes so idiosyncratic and so so distinctive, even at an early stage in the career, and that's definitely the case. So what, what Kristen was making initially, and this connects here, were paintings such as I've never seen before. Like literally never seen and I've seen a lot of paintings. Paintings of like ancient human or pre-human ancestors in lush but eerie uh, uh, landscapes and forests. And I was like, what is what is what on earth is this? With, with this kind of semi-apocalyptic green colors and like artificial but still connected with nature, and there was something so significant there. So with that as a background, we want to launch it, and this is not several years later, yeah. what's the connection between the ancient free humans and the figure such as our happening here? Yeah, it's still interested in a lot of those same ideas. Um, and I guess to maybe expand a little bit on, on that backstory, because it, this is also still so present in the work, but at the time I, I was really interested in what the first image might have been, what would have happened Sorry. before cave painting, um, something that maybe wasn't preserved in the fossil record. Um, so that was kind of what started me in, in that sort of time and space, um, thinking about like this hypothetical moment of just drawing a line in the dirt with a finger, um, and that being the very first mark, that first step that would have had to have happened um, before what we do know. Um, so like really the origins of Yeah, that. absolutely. And then thinking about that kind of gesture uh, alongside of origin of the story of consciousness or like a sense of self in this hypothetical figure. Um, so this idea of the mark being a kind of mirror of a conscious self, an arrival of a self is still present and What's shifted a little bit with the figures is also kind of pushing that same line of questioning into the future in a sort of hypothetical, post-human AI, maybe undergoing a similar process of, of coming into consciousness and discovering a sense of self and what that might look like. Um, so the figures are, are pulling from um, a lot, they pull from a lot of different visual reference points over the years um, that I am interested in as a kind of visual language to represent this idea. Um, and, and lately, I've been looking at medical mannequins. So that's where the kind of more specific of reference point. It's like Cindy, Sh uh, Cindy Sherman's yeah. photograph. Absolutely. Um, I, yeah, interested in them is the, these simulations of, of the body. And, I'm also just really interested too in those questions of you know body and consciousness and then the connections there. He's against his uh, mannequins also. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned it off. <laughs>
from those specific sources, but this is one case where I have kind of invented some based on looking at a lot of those things. So again, sometimes there's specific references and, and sometimes there's a little some more invention happening uh, as I kind of discover the composition to in the process. And is this is this form like purely invented on your part or some no. I think sometimes you're actually working from things you're seeing at home. Yes, yeah. So I mentioned the interest in medical mannequins. I've been collecting some skins and, and pieces uh, of those. Um, so I have a full head, which is this head that kind of reappears in a couple of the works. And then these empty skins, like the chest plate that's um, in this painting, or um, the arms and like the kind of lower torso, all of those pieces are, are actual objects that I've collected. I've got a nice hookup at a nursing department. <laughs> so when they're ready to throw things away, I can uh, snag some of them and then uh, full stage them in my studio and then use for reference as well. One of the one of the things that I find fascinating also about this new body of work, but it's also connected with your other work is is your really extensive understanding of time. Like Robert Smithson talked about, not talked about, wrote about this, but the importance of our artists of this, of going into remote past and remote futures. Like thinking in terms of hundreds of thousands or millions of years, not just like 2023. After all, we are recent additions to the 4.5 billion year old planet. And I, I think that's good. I think your work is really increasing that like that vastness of, of time. Do you think that does that sound? Absolutely, better? absolutely, hundred um, percent. I think. I mean, that also is a, a good way to bring in the beach too, and, and that's more recently become um, an important setting that I'm interested in because the beach feels like a place that holds that kind of tension in time makes us think of the origins of life, but we also can think about like the washing up of detritus. Um, so a lot of the objects too, I am kind of interested in how active they may or may not be. Are they emergent or are they remnants? Um, and then thinking about time as not being linear, always just kind of bouncing back and forth, and really like thinking about things in an analogous relationship and you know, you can think of time like the ebb and flow of the waves and the tide, the beach has just really been um, something I'm excited to continue exploring as a, a setting, you know, for these objects and these figures. That'd be important. Yes. By the way, anyone can ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, my important question is, you live in uh, Minneapolis, right? I do. That's pretty far from the ocean, but in your, in your, in your background, uh, do you have a particular connection with the ocean? Absolutely. I grew up in Southern California. <laughs> um, I've been, I'm in Minneapolis uh, teaching position, but um, I grew up going to Corona Del Mar, Laguna Beach, Newport Beach in Southern California, so that's just been a really like, generative space that I um, was interested in revisiting. Um, and I was kind of remembering my younger self going to the beach with my mom every weekend and the kind of like play or discovery that I would have in that space. Um, like tide pools, of course, like such a site of shift and change constantly, which is really exciting. Um, but also I would kind of pretend that I was some being that would emerge from the ocean and was like taking my first steps on land and like this is my environment. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was like like, like like how old? Oh, I don't know, like under ten probably. That's awesome. <laughs> you know. So you were revisiting the origins. Yeah, of I guess I've always been interested in origins in a way. <laughs> it's kind of intuitive. <laughs> I mean there's also a lot of a lot of like fossils uh, here, mm -hmm. uh, rocks, fossils. That's signaling what well, texture is important, but also signaling again that like vastness of time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, of, and of the rock formations and like, some of the paintings are from uh, Corona Del Mar Beach, um, with some embellishments. Like the ammonite fossils are not there. <laughs> like this is a painting of a rock. 
Yes. <laughs> but it looks like it could be um, an apocalyptic rock on another planet. Yeah, I really like um, using color to complicate time or, or remove maybe some of that immediate specificity and kind of keep things open to where in space or where in time they could potentially exist or, or maybe I mean, I'm interested in the sort of simultaneous existence in multiple spaces. Again, like time being this kind of amorphous, nonlinear form what or you, non-form. What do you, what do you all think? Do you, I, did, I, I love these words, but they're also like unsettling. Get that and, 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 kind and, of response and, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a, a unnerving in the way because, like, at the at the core of quite a number of them is something really familiar, like a figure at the beach. And now the beach and the sea and the rocks and all this. So it's really interesting to kind of hybridize all those really traditional painting genres into this new thing. Um, but to me, what's so interesting is like how you're layering the images over top of each other. Kind of, I think you alluded to talking about time not being linear, and maybe there's a metaphor in that where like all these things are sort of all happening at once or not happening at all, or I don't know. Either you want to talk more on that. Absolutely, or, yeah. yeah. I mean, the overlapping image um, definitely serves to kind of create that bounce back. Um, with these different objects and like this one it is pulling from a fossil tool actually um, a shell tool uh, and then the mask form comes from uh, an Instagram filter that turns your face into a mask so it is based off of off of my face um, but you know whatever the image may be it's always something that I'm pulling from prehistoric and it's something that's that kind of future signifier um, to bring them together, right, to create that tension in time and to kind of present both things as like similar, uh, as analogous, similarly uncanny, uh, absolutely. I think it's a good point, but also what's that, what's probably fascinating for me is how it's not just figure in a landscape, but landscape and figure <laughs> converge, Na- nature and human converge, uh, and not in, mess- not in just like a pleasant, lovely way. I mean, just figure that sort of fall apart. And that I, I think, you know, the, the, the pressures of, of time and uh, entropy are there, and those are world-shaping forces. So I think I think that's you're in a very interesting place, especially now when the human centric approach to the world is looking not only crappy, but like frankly catastrophic, you know, like completely dangerous. I mean even like with this right here, it's like the so artificial thing that also is acting in a way as a fossil or mm-hmm. something generated by the sea. Right? Yeah, I mean, definitely, yeah, thinking about them and some of these things like future fossils, thinking about that like, integration of a figure in space uh, along, along the lines of that coming into consciousness or, or discovering a sense of self through that bounce back. And, like, uh, the marks are you know, this internal force exerted externally. They're a trace, they're imprint of this self so you know where it's like the fossils where the empty skins are you know like physical remnants of, of the physical body the mark and the etchings and like the tools the altered material is the remnant of, of a mind like through a physical body and that again going back to the connection of, of consciousness and the body and that bounce back between body and environment and altering things being really crucial. What well, about the marks here? Yeah, um, so this is a, a shell that I collected myself and 
carved with a piece of obsidian. Uh, because it was looking at obsidian being generated by volcanoes. Yes, a really, a really uh, a cool stone that um, when flaked into a tool can be like super like, razor sharp. Uh, and I have some from a prehistoric technology class that I took back in undergrad, so I've kept it all these years. Um, but I wanted to make my own version of, of some of the fossils I was looking at. So there's a a fossilized seashell that has geometric engravings, which as of now is one of the oldest um, evidences we have of mark making, of image making in the fossil record, and it's uh, about 500,000 years old. But, um, yeah. Not made by, not made by the weather, made by. Yes, by mm -hmm. a, an ancestor, so mm -hmm. it, that predates Homo sapiens. This is uh, the time of Homo erectus, um, so I think earlier hominid ancestor like after Lucy, um, but the species that really like, migrated um, all across the, the world and evolved into all the other, <laughs> you know, cousin species we've, we've had in the past. What about the expressions? Mm. Yes. I think of them <laughs> as <laughs> contemplative. Um, <laughs> Part of it is. <laughs> I understand that, <laughs> yes. I mean, and that is the natural expression of this, this medical mannequin head that I have. The mouth is perpetually ate. You can't physically push the jaw closed, um, but it won't stay that way. Um, so I understand that reference. I feel like for me, I don't know, there's a you know, that kind of unnerving or like more sinister undertone of that expression. I love this sinister undertone in your nature. I really <laughs> feel so great. like, uh, it feels more neutral, but I do love that association. I mean, I love that it's there. Um, but I, you know, they feel contemplative, you know, like a, I, I think actually back in graduate school, one of those early paintings that I made of this sort of pre-human hominid was looking at its hand and had a similar expression with the mouth and ate, like in awe of right. like understanding this connection. It was like the moment maybe right before or right after this hypothetical figure would have made that mark. So that mouth and ate was like, was present. <laughs> maybe that's something maybe subconsciously that drew me to the mannequin head. Well, I mean, absolutely there's like a emotional content and in your work. So did it be, I mean, because of the posture of these quasi bodies and also these complex expressions, then that increase, that increases the strength of your work. Now, I'm not a painter, but I know that I, I do a lot of things. But I, I think that color is a really, very significant in your work in a very unusual way. Could you talk a little bit? Yeah. About that? Color, I feel like right now in, in these newer works is kind of in a process of expanding because I used to work in, in very limited palettes. Um, green. Lots of green and red, and because I was interested in them as color complements, I was interested in that tie into um, the evolution of primate vision, like way, way, way back, um, and that ability to see reds and greens being an important like evolution marker. But, um, yeah, I really love that kind of hot, saturated color palette. And again, to me, that, that really did make these prehistoric images feel futuristic or otherworldly. Uh, but I've been really enjoying expanding the palette and, and neutralizing things a little bit more or using more uh, naturalistic-ish colors Ish. in some I mean, things. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, in parts of it and like, in, in Still being able to achieve that, that sense. Like, I think I realized I, I don't need to run on that, the limited palette anymore. Um, so it's been really fun to, to expand. There is something that you and I haven't talked about, really, but I just thought about this. I mean, there's a California, I mean, there's a California, of, you know, spectacular ocean and mountains, and I like, guess also wonderful and But there's also California uh, simulated nature. To to the extreme uh, and uh, the movies and California man painting and sci-fi. 
Is that significant? Artificial. I mean, the, the cup, these do, I mean, there is something eerie and off and not naturalistic mm -hmm. and simulated. It. That, once again, I think that's a total strength. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like the sense of inventing a space as much as I'm inventing the figures. Again, even if you're based off of, you know, I'm starting with a photo of this actual formation at Corona Del Mar Beach, but um, they're always jumping out things. So I think that that process of invention of kind of discovering color or discovering all the details of the composition through the painting process is, is important too. That sense of intuition. You know, again, I have specific references, but I still don't know exactly what each painting will look like when I'm starting it. So there is there is that sense of discovery along the way too. Any questions? Yeah, questions. Absolutely. <laughs> so these two, I don't know who is responsible for hanging these two together, but it seems really like this one and this yeah, one. Yeah, super genius because I don't know perspective and a lot of your work did not seem perhaps as like prominent. But here it's like we could have made these, we could have found these objects. I'm not sure. Right, it could be both, mm -hmm. but perspective, it seems like we could have ripped that off of us, or found this, or we made it, and we're looking down at it in awe, right? Mm -hmm. And so perspective in these two, in particular, seems so important, so I don't know. Great point. Yeah, I mean, they're so much more close up, too. Yeah. They're kind of the, more, the most like intimate, as far as the actual scene and the scale. Like, the, the size of this shell, it's, it's tiny. Um, and I mean, I kind of played with scale a little bit in, in this one too. This this purple mask is actually a, a silicone mask that I made. Um, same with the, the green one here, but um, to kind of play with in, in, in companionship with those mannequin skins that I've collected. But um, those are also shells that I've collected and have the relative scale of the mask to the shell is not true, true to life. Those shells are also very tiny. Um, so, yeah, definitely there's a intentional play. In, in and then just mathematically, there's just like a shell, shell, and shell, shell, <laughs> or shells, shell, which I think is Yeah, true. and mm -hmm. Mark said, I mentioned that, that fossil, the actual fossil shell that I was, you know, I wanted to make my own version of, but those are the actual marks that are on that. Those are pulled and just isolated from the shell itself and, and placed over. I love it that there's like these very compelling semi eerie paintings. The each has a, has at its core, not at its core, but at its origins in a way, like a direct experience of you, you, with your experience, your mm -hmm. your experience with pop rock or with this mask. Or, I think that's that's great. Yeah, each painting really is meant to feel like these individualized moments of, of things that are happening upon and again you don't know like did we make it or did we find it is it emergent or is it remnant you know how activated is it and i think that's also why i'm drawn compositionally to like singular for the most part forms or figures in a space rather than this kind of grander like multi-figure interacting it's more about Placing myself in the scene or placing the viewer in a relationship with, with the thing. So, um, speaking of Amherst, <laughs> uh, Emily Dickinson has a great poem uh, in, 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 this, in which she, she wrote Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. So, is there like slant truth in, in your verse? For example, is there self portraiture? going on in a slant way? I would say, yeah, I think that's an accurate reading. Um, it's not going to be some Emily. Like, for example, yeah. here, this, this. Who's the figure behind the mask? That is me. Okay. <laughs> so, but I know, but, a, but a, a reasonable viewer would not immediately lead right. to that conclusion. And, and slant truth. It, yes, it's, it's not doesn't have to be me, but so 
sometimes if I have a, a, a very specific idea of a position or a composition, some or some action that a figure is doing, I might just need to use myself to model for it. So I'm I'm wearing the the mannequin chest plate and then holding the, the head. Um, yeah, and you had an awesome starfish. <laughs> and yes, that's <laughs> a, an ochre starfish, which is a species of starfish that is at uh, Corona Del Mar Beach. Cool. <laughs> um, so, do you go on like research trips back to California? Is this from memory or no? Or this is um, taking advantage of being home for the holidays and making sure. I, I think it kind of happened over a few family trips because my family is still there, um, and I started to realize I was kind of interested in that while I was back in Minnesota and kind of thinking, my gosh, like, I don't really have any pictures because. You know, I don't think to just take all these photos, going to this place that is just such a regular part of like a ritual with, with my mom. But um, the most recent trip um, that I went back to visit family, then it was like very deliberate. Like, you know, I'm, I'm lagging behind on the walk and to take like all these photos and just Excellent. build an, build a little bit of an archive while I'm here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was actually wondering Starfish, starfish, yeah. Because um, I don't know if you talked to the guy who all of the talk, uh, but uh, he seems to be so different than maybe everything else. Because like all these shells, we don't know if they are inhabited or not, right? And if it's living with something or not. And he's just doing his own thing. That's <laughs> like, yeah. That's the only direction we own. He really. That's a great point. That is a really great point. I think that's not inhabited. Absolutely, I think um, 
yeah, I don't know that that would have occurred to me back in grad school, but that was like allowed. <laughs> that that of course. Was, yeah, yeah. Fit within my conceptual exactly. framework that I was developing. Uh, There's also nothing like being in Minnesota when you're like so far from the coast, right? You can't miss it, right? But, but I mean, I said that. I said that. But I'm like, like, like a pro Minnesota thing. Like you're you're not that far. I mean, the lake. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm surrounded by bodies of water. I mean, the, 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 I mean right? Superior is immense and immensely That's powerful, true. and it's not that far. And if you go to Duluth, I mean, you have. Uh, this intensity, you know, it's fresh water, but it has like oceanic intensity. Mm -hmm. and, and there's still a sense of that kind of discovery and wonder that I can access there. I, I went camping up in northern Minnesota after the opening of the show. Awesome. To the boundary waters? Okay. Yes, to the boundary waters, which is a wilderness area um, Very along cool. Lake Superior and the, and the border with Canada, and it's, it's like fully remote, um, awesome. off grid, you know, just like incredible. Um, so I spent some time on, on the water, I was kayaking, I was hiking. Wow, and it's it's a similar gesture of wandering through the space and, and you're still crouching down low and looking at things up close and finding these, these little moments and um, far be it for me to ever like suggest anything that you should do, but I'm, I'm just, I'd be curious if in the, if in the, in the future if Minnesota begins, begins to enter your paintings in, in some sense. I suppose I can't rule that out, but I feel like for now the, the yeah, niche is, is new. The remote, the remote yeah. future, as Smithson said. So any other questions? So when you're talking about intuition, you know, and how like you use that to like find your way to the painting. So like what does intuition mean to you? Like how do you how do you define that? I've realized that intuition is a, a practice or it's like a muscle that needs to be exercised. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's maybe something that we think about as like it just happens, but it's like you cultivate it. Um, and so I think leaving a lot of openness in the process of the has helped, like like I mentioned earlier, is, you know, have specific reference images, whether I'm finding them online or I've taken them myself or I'm staging objects in my studio, but I don't know what the colors are going to be. I don't know how the space will fully develop and come together. It's like compositing a lot of those different references together. And, um, and I do a lot of editing too. I think that's also maybe just in terms of process, a little bit of, of why the, the overlapping images come to really be prominent is because in a lot of the process I've been painting over things and like leaving um, traces of, of those previous images, sort of like a, a reverse archaeology. Um, all the paintings are acrylic by the way, so I like to build them up in layers and that process too of working in layers and building up also I think has just been really conducive to Again, allowing space for that intuition. Great. Well, any other questions? Yeah.